all of our trustees are here. And thank, oh, thank you. And the first uh, item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and it is law with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of people for public comment, and I'm going to give my little public comment feel, which many of you have heard often, but. Uh, the public library is founded on the First Amendment, which is freedom of speech and freedom of, of assembly. And that's exactly what we're all doing here today, gathering together to freely speak. Um, the two most important things I would like us all to remember today are one, to be respectful of one another, and two, to be civil to one another. We may not like what someone is saying, but we all need to listen and let them say it without interruption, or without distractions from the audience. Um, so let's please treat people as we would wish to be treated if we were up at the podium. Now I'm gonna read a few things from our policy. The community library, this is our public comment policy. The community library network board of trustees operates under the Idaho code open meeting law. The board is pleased to take comments under advisement, but we will not re be responding at this meeting to the comments today. Um, the board is committed to conducting its meetings in a civil, orderly, efficient, and productive manner. When addressing the board, please, if you can sign in before speaking, giving your name and community, we would like you to address only library-related topics. Comments should be addressed directly to the board and not to the audience. Everybody gets a three minutes um, for each speaker, and a person may speak at the podium once during the meeting. In cases of disagreement, the, great, the speaker must use grace and tact. Persons addressing the board are expected to observe a level of civility and decorum appropriate for a, a public meeting. And no personal attacks or disruptions from the audience members will be tolerated. <laughs> as soon as we're done with public comment, then we will move into our regular meeting and everybody is welcome to stay and listen, but we won't be accepting public comments after that. We, we need to be able to run our meeting. So here we go. First person, and we have a, we have a timing person. And um, so I ask you to please be respectful of that. Even if you wanna run over, please be respectful when the buzzer, when the dinger ding. So the first person on the, um, the list is Betsy Kovach. Thank you. Um, my name is Betsy Kovach of Post Falls. I am a mother of two, one, a now grown adult, 20 years old, and a 13-year-old who attends school here locally. I am here to ask that you please do not let board members' personal agendas regulate everyone's freedom of choice to read books that they enjoy. Both of my kids love reading. Um, they grew up at the library. My oldest child is an avid reader. In high school, he averaged 50 novels a year, although having less time for his um, reading of choice these days. Uh, realistic fiction is a favorite of both of my kids. Through be reading, they get to meet characters that they relate to, that are going through experiences that they can also relate to. It helps them to enjoy reading, to learn, to feel represented and validated at a time of growing up when they are navigating a world of uncertainty. Every child or teen deserves this. It's important for all youth to be allowed the same opportunity to have books on library shelves that they can relate to during the trying times of adolescence. <laughs> My 20 year old has read 62 books on the concerning juvenile books list. <laughs> Um, what might happen to a teen or a child that reads such literature during an impressionable time when their brain is developing, you might wonder? Well, he is not damaged. Um, he is, however, a President's List 4.0 GPA, second year student at Clark Honors College in the University of Oregon, co-president of the club on campus with a packed social calendar. I believe that his love of learning began on our many, many trips to the library. 
I'm here to ask that you do not allow board members to insert their personal beliefs and philosophies into their actions as board members for the Community Library Network. I believe it's of the utmost importance to adhere to ethical standards that they are serving to represent the community as a whole and not just those with the same narrow views. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, the next person is uh, Sammy Randezo. I am Sammy Randezo of Port Lane. Um, I'm going to be blunt just to ensure that this message gets delivered. I'm not really sure what we have to continue to discuss the blocking of many books in the library that have been deemed inappropriate only by a certain group of people. A group with the goal to remove things they don't agree with as an attempt to force others to follow the same morals and beliefs they do while masquerading as protectors of children and liberty. When I picture a protector of children and liberty, I picture my boyfriend who was a father of homeschooled children and a combat veteran with three deployments, a combat action badge and a bronze star. I listen to stories he tells me of medical support he provided to special forces while in Afghanistan alongside United States Green Beret soldiers who fought against the Taliban, which is a, ter a terrorist group with the goal to force their country to follow their um, religious beliefs. This is why women in Afghanistan have recently lost their ability to pursue any education. The people hoping to ban these they, these books they deem inappropriate are also endorsing the House Bill 139, which is a bill, if passed, would help take away the ability of parents to raise their children in a way they want to and instead give that ability to the government. A bill that would also successfully ban the Bible from libraries and schools since the content of the Bible fits the description of materials that could subject libraries and schools to potential fines. The main point of my message is that history has shown us that it is never beneficial to a community to force morals and beliefs based on religion or to give government more control over yourself or your children. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next person doesn't have a last name. It looks like Trish Arsh. This is the third person that signed up. It's Charity from Hauser. It's C H A R I T Y. Doesn't look like that. <laughs> that's how I signed up. Okay. And I was the third person on the sheet. I oh, were you? Okay. That, that's it. It doesn't look like that. But if do you have more than one sheet? Uh, yes. Okay. Then it's not me. Okay. Um. Yes, I do see you as the third person. On. Okay. All right. So then we'll go with. Um. Is it Marge? Dance? Marty. Marty. Okay, right sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't have a hard time. You guys need to print for me. <laughs> Marty. Uh, Marty Modan, Post Falls, retired parole officer from the state of Washington, Seattle, 24 years. Uh, I'm quoting, uh, there are a few quotes here from the book Identical, which is uh, all over the place in the libraries in this county. Uh, here's a young girl who's uh, fantasizing about having sex with her father. Quote, there's daddy who comes home every day, dives straight into a tall amber bottle, falls into a stonewall well of silence, a place where he can tread the suffocating loneliness, except for the a sperm thing, would he fall on his knees in front of me if I were more like mom? Less like him, would he come begging to me too? Let me stay if he realized I want to love him the way mom used to? Really, far cry from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Right. His voice was a soft hiss. Are you awake? Talk to me, daddy. Ish, ish, is so lonely. I've never heard of him sound like that, like a stranger. Where was my daddy? Kaylee, all sweetness, wanted to comfort daddy who drew her into his lap, stroked her hair, kissed her gently, cheeks, eyes, finally on her lips, but not nasty or mean or tongue or anything but misplaced love, love meant for mom. He just held her, kissed her, breathed wild turkey all over her until they both fell asleep, woven together. 
Who benefits from this? Nobody. Who benefits from this? I supervise child molesters who destroyed young kids' lives by inculcating into them through grooming the same smut that desensitize it. Where, where, where does all this sex trafficking come from? How do you think guys lure children? They don't, a, a, a child molester doesn't go up to a kid and say, hey, baby, you want to have sex? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It's very incremental. It's gradual. This information is a recruiting tool for Vicious child molesters who are in the business of destroying young, vulnerable children's minds. There is no First Amendment right to molesting children. There is no First Amendment right to grooming children to make them more susceptible to the predatory people in our midst. There is no benefit, there is no civil right of a child molester to to put into the mind if, if if i gave this book to a kid on the street i'd be in handcuffs in five minutes thank you and this is this right lois moore is it lois there you go. i didn't know that was okay i'm not afraid. i'm talking to you Jesus. okay all right hey enough well i'm just we, repeating his comment back to him we need civility here please be careful everyone um all right so larry almeida i'm being called out is it i've only recently uh had the information delivered to me that indicates that there is a possible problem here um, my concern is that the problem is not the board as such. Um, there may be members of the board who have issues with certain ways that the board has done business uh, in the past. I um, worked for this library district for many years, and um, I can tell you I've known uh, many of the board members for, for quite some time. Uh, in the past, the way things were done is that they followed the law, the state of Idaho law, which gave direction as to how books were to be reviewed. If you have problems with a book, like the gentleman just before, there are ways to deal with that. And in the past, we have always done that in a, a good way that has worked. Um, I don't know enough about the current situation to uh, be able to address the situation with possible board members who may be having issues with the way we've done things in the past. Um, but I recommend that they continue to follow the law, to listen to the state library, and to also listen to the, to the people in the district who have concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lynn Purcell. I'm Lynn Purcell from Cox Falls, and thank you, first of all, for setting a tight time for the public to talk. Um, I want to address some questions that I have not seen addressed anywhere before this. One, who is in charge of deciding what materials are purchased by the library? Two, how do these people even find out if the type of books we're talking about even exist? I mean, do you go and search them out or do vendors send them to you and say, here, these are free of charge, please put them in your library? How often do you say no to this type of book? And why is our tax money being used to purchase these inappropriate books when we, the people, don't want them in our library system to corrupt our children? So you're using our money to corrupt our own children. And I've also heard of, like the Hayden Library, putting these books on display. So you walk into the library, there they are. That's not right either. 
It is not incumbent upon libraries to insist upon buying every book that has ever been published. It is not censorship to be discerning regarding books that are purchased by the library system. Censorship is preventing publication and even distribution <clears throat> to the public at large, and that's usually a government thing, not a library thing. I think World War II. That's not the issue here. We simply don't want pornography in our libraries purchased by us, the taxpayers. Let people go out and spend their own money if they want to see this film. Leave our money alone and leave our kids alone. Let's keep our libraries free of pornography. I don't want to defund the libraries. I just want the libraries to be discerning and astute in what books they choose to buy and stop buying porn for our children. Thank you. David Rain. David Rain. David Rain. David oh, Rain. am I not? Is it? Pardon? Post Falls? Yes. yes. What? Okay. okay. Yeah, Dave Riley. Riley, sorry. So um, I figured I'd come today and actually go uh, into the library uh, because there's been some debate about whether these books actually exist. They do. Yeah. I just pulled these off the shelves of this library and uh, I figured let's take a let's take a look. The first cut wasn't the deepest. No, not at all. It was like the others. A subtle rend of anxious skin, a gentle pulse of crimson, just enough to hush the demons shrieking inside my brain. This is a book about a young teenage girl who cuts herself. And it glorifies it. Here's another book called Glass by Ellen Hopkins. These are all Ellen Hopkins books, by the way, the same woman that wrote the book Identical, which is about a, an adult uh, screwing his 10 year old daughter. It's incest, it's obscene, it's pornography. So in this book, Glass, it says, I'll get the pipe. I watch her inhale, eyes popping pleasure. Oh, thank God it's not street crank. She talks about the last crank she snorted, a tip from a customer. Oh yeah, trucker love, truckers love their crank. And when they're all cranked up, they love other stuff too. The ice opens her mouth and she tells me about it. Some of them are really gross. I always make them shower first. No way I'll let something dirty up inside me. Condoms? Yeah, they're supposed to wear them, but they pay a lot extra if you don't make them. It's a book about uh, smoking meth and screwing uh, people prostitution. This is all in the young adult section, which is available for children as young as 12. Here's another book called Smoke. I was on the floor with my arms pinned over my head and a hand jammed between my legs. Please, Caleb, stop. Don't do this. Ah, come on, he said. Pretend that you don't. But you know, uh, but, but you know you want this more than I do. All the girls do. Then I felt it hard behind his jeans. No, but it came out uh, a harsh wish whisper. I was petrified dad would hear. Maybe even more scared of that than what was happening to me. One wicked thrust and Caleb drove himself inside me. Something ripped, something pried. I thought he would tear me apart. This is a book about getting raped. And another one uh, by Ellen Hopkins. He pushes me sideways and back into a nearby bedroom and it's on me. So suddenly I can't react. The next thing I know, I'm on the bed beneath him, held fast by the weight of his body. No, Garrett, no, stop. But the words are trapped behind the booze-flavored drool inside of his mouth. I mean, this is not appropriate for 12-year-olds. This should not be in the young adult section. None of Ellen Hopkins' books are appropriate. Every one of them has a content advisory, according to booklooks.com, but at least three, which means that children under the age of 18 can't freaking buy it at a store. Thank you. Teresa Burkett. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Burkett and I'm a resident of Post Falls. My husband and I are retired and we enjoy being parents and grandparents. We love the programs offered in our library, most especially for children. I really don't want to be here, but because of public misinformation, I feel the need to speak up. 
I like to do research in order to speak on a subject. I perused the CLN's website and found a few items I would like to speak about. On the website, I found material selection policy governed by L ALA's library, Bill of Rights. Number one, libraries should provide materials and information presenting all points of view on current and historical issues. Materials should not be proscribed or removed because of partisan or doctrinal disapproval. And this is the ALA's interpretation of that right. Access to library resources and services, regardless of sex, gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. The American Library Association stringently and unequivocally maintains that libraries and librarians have an obligation to resist efforts that systematically exclude materials dealing with any subject matter, including sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Thank you, trustees, for the work you've done. I know this board has done a great job implementing a lot of these rights, excluding no one. Another item I researched was the library's code of conduct per the Idaho Commission of Libraries I found, and found that they subscribe to golden rules for board members. One being, after a policy or rule is adopted by the majority vote of the library board, do not criticize or revoice your opinion or opposition publicly. Well, I found recently a library trustee, Audison, in Idaho Tribune, dated January 27, 2023. From what I understand, this is quote, from what I understand, the American Library Association is that they should block all challenges to books. In fact, our last director did brag that every single book challenge had been denied. This was a mischaracterization. She never bragged that they were denied. I know the library has a process of reconsideration, and I believe that should have been emphasized. Thank you. Thank you. Are they elected? For okay. The Excuse me. We're in public comment now. Sorry, my fault. Um, Emily Christopherson. I want to say how much I appreciate this library district. Last week, my homeschool group was able to reserve a free community room so our kids could exchange homing valentines and play games together. This weekend, my kids are very eager to enter their projects in the homeschool science fair hosted by the library. My third grader, who happens to be a reluctant writer, wrote her first ever paragraph, which she proudly displayed on her science project board. My family has had so many of these joyful moments, all thanks to opportunities we've had access to through our libraries. There seems to be a myth out there that library usage is on the decline, but just yesterday I attended book babies in this room and the room was packed with smiling care caregivers and an enthusiastic librarian. And what were the conversations I overheard? But the library needs more of these events. Unfortunately, some community members are so focused on a handful of books, they aren't seeing the big picture. All of these amazing moments made possible by our public libraries. Uh, I really don't know what else there is to say about the books that would be compelling to people attending these meetings. My kids have grabbed many books off the shelves, especially my youngest and enthusiastic two-year-old. And yet we've never found anything harmful to minors and certainly not pornographic but perhaps my definition is different than some. Because there is a list formed by a group who has threatened to defund libraries if their demands aren't met. On this list are over 700 books like Everywhere Babies and Tango Makes Three, which is a picture book where all the events are true. Not Quite Narwhal, a book with absolutely no transgender theme, and my kids thought that the book reminded them about Elf, which is a sweet Christmas movie that many of us enjoy. The family book by Todd Parr, Captain Underpants, who was Frederick Douglass? Yes, like any history book, I guarantee this book has its bias, maybe the opposite bias of say Rush Revere, which is also found in our library. In fact, I challenge you to find nonfiction historical writings without bias, which is why keeping critical thinking skills is so important. And the book that shocked me the most on their list, a 1936 classic, The Story of Ferdinand, on their list for a gender identity theme. The books we've heard some commenters read passages from during these meetings are indeed handpicked for a reason. They are chosen because of their mature themes and they're chosen to incite fear and anger in the public. 
They're chosen to destroy your trust in public libraries. And these hand-picked books are a distraction from the greater good and purpose of libraries. In a collection so large, I am sure there are books on the shelves that need to be moved to adult. And I expect library staff to take community concerns seriously. And I hope this board will come up with solutions. But I do question the credibility of some community members when they think the story of Ferdinand is concerning. Thank you. Um, Did we get on your list? We still get on your list? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Put me at the bottom. What is your name? Daniel Fry. Thank you. Can I go to Jane, Jane Clark? Katie. Thank you, Katie. Certainly. Where are you from? Post Falls, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, the next person to speak is Mariana Cochran. I'm sorry I missed the January meeting since I understood it was well attended. No doubt helped by your PDA press allies who the day before issued a thinly veiled clarion call for supporters. Regardless, the meeting's content requires much clarification. Fact, for 16 months, a citizen group has presented a wide array of public uh, input, including testimony from a convicted child sex offender regarding porn's impact on him as a youth, a probation officer regarding his repeat witness to the influence of porn on youth and adult offenders, testimony of suicidal ideation as a minor due to the influence of pornography in her home, citations of studies about porn's adverse impact on kids, and exact passages of blatant pornography. This citizens group has been unwavering in our repeat emphasis that we are focusing on kids' books and uh, the kids' section, not adult access to adult books. Fact, any minor can check out any book from any section, including the adult section, and yes, including books not owned by CLN from other areas. Fact, inarguably pornographic passages from CLN teen books were read to the board at last June and July's meetings. Anyone can view those meetings on CLN's YouTube channel. Just because you haven't read pornography in CLN's kids' books doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Fact, contrary to Chairman Blank's assertion at the January meeting about only receiving two book challenges last year, the actual number is five. Here's the stack were submitted last year that I know of. True, not all five were escalated to the board because the submitters are well aware that all will be denied. Fact, all five were denied. Chairman Blank stated at the last meeting, give us the titles. Fact, January's first public commentator stated the book title he referenced, but the meeting note video shows Chairman Blank that you were writing when he stated the title, so you missed it. Trustee McRae heard the title and referenced it later in the meeting. Fact, the CLN board, the previous director, and Lindsay, the interim director, have been sent emails with not only titles, but blatantly obscene passages with the actual page numbers. Here are just two of those emails. Fact, Lindsay's January presentation made it crystal clear that CLN chooses to set aside the specific information you've been given, taking zero initiative and making zero changes to your procedures to evaluate existing or new books after having received our information. Fact, Trustee McRae can attempt to retract your reference to the challenge process as illusory, but video is forever, and more importantly, no book has ever been removed by CLN. So Trustee McRae, feel free to use gimmick, ruse, ploy, or sham as descriptors of the challenge process. Fact, the majority of this board and this director have repeatedly and vehemently denied and deflected any responsibility regarding kids' access to pornography and obscenity and CLN. So since you will make the changes, the voters will on May 16th. The countdown has begun. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy Jones. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Jones, and I am the author of three children's books. I have worked with children for 27 years as a child advocate, a counselor, a mentor, and as a legal guardian for two children, as well as a teacher. 
for, at the age of about 20, I read a book from the library. I spend a lot of time in the library, lots of libraries across the country. And the book was called Myra Breckenridge. I didn't know what the book was about. I thought it was about a girl. I read it. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. All I knew is this lady was putting on a dildo and she was with another woman. I felt very dirty and defiled by it. And it wasn't until much later that I figured out what was going on. So I never finished reading the book. I took it back to the library and I got rid of it. Um, but that was nothing compared to what I've seen in the book called Gender Queen. I can't wait to have your cock in my mouth. I am going to give you the blowjob of your life and then I want you inside of me. Holy shit. This is a page 167 out of Gender Queer. That book is available in the Coeur d'Alene Library. This is uh, from Wikipedia about the author, and it says this, uh, this book, Gender Queer, was listed as the most banned book in September 2021 by the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom. The U.S. school districts during the school year 21 and 22 uh, had this queer gender book as the most frequently challenged book and banned in 41 school districts, yet it's available in the library for any child to have. Um, when a child is under the age of puberty, they are missing three chemicals in their brain, which if they are traumatized before that time when they have those chemicals, then they cannot process trauma properly. They don't, they don't have the reasoning ability. So they become, uh, in their limbic system, they become frozen. So they may be 20, 30, 40, but they will be the age emotionally that they were when they were traumatized. So they may be 20, but they're really only six. By allowing these books into the library, we are inviting these very same things that the books perpetrate upon your children and grandchildren. These books promote sodomy, rape, uh, incest, torturing people, drug abuse. Thank I just you. encourage you to make different choices. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Blake. I have the great privilege to address you this afternoon on behalf of our community's hardworking family men, men who are right now making all of our lives better by their productivity, their provision and protection of their families. Linemen, engineers, military officers, excavators, mechanics, welders, plumbers, electricians, policemen, lawyers, teachers, doctors, and business owners, all friends of mine. These men, along with their spouses, peers, and colleagues have entrusted you with upholding the prevailing community standards of reflecting the community's values with the content that of material given to their children. These men demand that their children be protected from the porno pornography and obscene material which you are currently allowing unfettered access to. They entrusted you to uphold truth, goodness, and beauty, and were left horrified and disgusted by the material found on the shelves in the section of the library reserved for children, material that is harmful to their children. These men want you to know that they will stand behind you in solidarity as you refuse to bow to the bullies who have cowed you into this precarious situation you find yourself. They will support you in your efforts to maintain a vibrant, healthy, safe outlet for their families to enjoy. All of the hardworking family men within our community want a strong, thriving library that provides access to beautifully creative, thought-provoking, exciting literature, both fiction and nonfiction, for the benefit of all. I shared content offered in our libraries to all Kootenai legislators via email. These legislators are right now working hard to provide you, the librarians and trustees, what you need to protect yourself from those who are demanding obscene, pornographic, and harmful material to our children. You can say, no, we will no longer be your distribution way to the children. Our legislator, one of them, replied to me saying that his state filtered device blocked the content from being downloaded. Do you realize what that means? 
an adult serving in our legislator could not access the content that you are allowing minors to have. Because this is strictly a shocking revelation, revelation and should stand alone as proof that vulgar, obscene, and pornographic material is knowingly and willfully being offered to vulnerable and impressionable children who deserve better. So what are our community standards? What does our community value? Our community values honesty, not the delusion that drug use will ease life's challenges, which this library promotes to minors. Our community values moral uprightness, not degenerate and pervasive filth, which this library promotes to minors. Our community values proper relations between adults and children, not the perversion of adults preying on children to satisfy their sexual fantasies, which this library promotes to minors. Our, children, our community values bravery, not the cowardly trick that entices children to believe evil is good and wrong is right, which this library promotes to minors. Our about community values truth, not the lie that your feelings determine your sex or gender, which this library promotes to minors. Our community values life, not the insidious lie that our daughters and sons Thank are you. expendable, worth little more Thank than how you. others can use them, leading to self-mutilation and suicidal ideologies, which that this is library enough. promotes to minors. That's enough. I have never spoken to this library before. I have like five No. 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 Please, Please stop. stop. Please stop. Which this library promotes to minors. Stop. Our, our community values the oh, father, not the sick and poor. Hey, enough. Enough. This stop. library promotes to minors. Yeah. Yeah. Our you, community values she is cut off. not the she is. the fight to cut rid of out. Please, which this yeah. library promotes no. to minors. That is enough. Thank that is enough. Don't harass me. You just threatened me. Okay, that is enough. Can I have my, my conversation? Then make me shut up. Hey, harass me. Listen. Uh, listen. listen. We will call. We will call law enforcement if you cannot be civil. We will. I do not. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I pay my taxes. I love this library. I love everyone in this. this community. Wait a second. Stop. We need to stop. Take it outside. Stop my face and threaten me. That's no. enough. If you want to take the objection to law enforcement, that's fine. If this crowd gets out of hand, law enforcement is very close. All right. No touching my cheek is not acceptable. The other. <laughs> The other thing I would like to say is there will be no more going over. We give everyone three minutes. And when you abuse it, then what happens is people start not being able to receive public comment time. It is not necessary for this. It is not required by law that we have public comment. I am asking every single one of you to please ob obey what we've asked you to do, to speak for three minutes and three minutes alone so that everybody here gets a chance to speak. All right. The next person is Tom Hanley. My name is Tom Hanley, H-A-N-L-E-Y. Same spelling as Hanley Avenue in Port Lane, only other than Post Falls. There's been quite a bit of discussion in the past few months regarding certain books in the Community Library Network's collection uh, that many consider to be inappropriate for minors. I believe the trustees are either misinformed, not all of them, but most of them, or the board is a coward, or it supports allowing children's areas by allowing a smut in the children's areas in the library. I'm not a lawyer, but in my opinion, the board is hiding behind minimum tenets of the law in order to ensure controversial material remains available to children. Number one, Idaho statute provides very clear graphic definition of what obscene materials are. And there certainly are obscene materials contained in our books for minors. Number two, a statute under Children and vulnerable adults permits a defense, a defense if the defendant is a bona fide public library. So you got a little secret out to put the pornography out there. And another statute 
uh, talks about indecency and obscenity, uh, talking about considering a material as a whole. So just because you got garbage scattered throughout the book, that doesn't count. Um, so because the book as a whole is not focused strictly on pornography, coupled with the library's loophole, the library finds built in the children's section areas of the library to be acceptable and defended. Per Idaho code, one of the primary powers of the duties of the Board of Trustees is to create policy. So do we taxpayers want a board which seeks to do the legal minimum or a board which does its best to protect the children of Kootenai County? Some will cry filter materials out as a violation of the First Amendment, but um, we don't really, we do control things already. We have an FCC that prohibits certain words that put on the radio and on the air. We have adult themed programs that have to be played late at night, or we have filters right here on the children's computers in the library. So regarding the First Amendment, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting, and as Biden would say, you know, the thing. <laughs> uh, but the CLN Library Board of Trustees is not Congress. And your job is to create sound policy, especially when it comes to protection of children. It's possible this board has awakened a local sleeping giant, and that's the local county voters, Kootenai County voters. So as I said in my opening, my name is Tom Hanley, H-A-N-L-E-Y, and it's quite possible that you may find my name, Tom Hanley, on the ballot on election day, May 16th. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff Lewis. Jeff Lewis, Post Falls. Quote from the uh, CDA Press, January 2023 by Board Chair Katie Blank. We have added to our material selection policy from Idaho Code that says we won't knowingly have obscenity in the library. Fact is, this board is very much aware there are hundreds of sexually explicit and pornographic books in our libraries. Marianne Cochran wrote in the CDA press last week, and I quote, for well over a year, citizens have been civilly and respectfully voicing concerns regarding hundreds of inappropriate children's and teen library books to this board. But I've been astonished over the last 16 months while researching thousands of books and discovering the abundance of corrosive books for kids. I passed out a uh, sheet to you from a book called Dead End by Jason Myers. I'm not going to read the whole page, page 77. I'm just going to read one sentence. Mo slid Gina's underwear to the side and shoved two fingers into her pussy. It was dry, so he slid his fingers in and out a few times over to get her crotch moist, his fingers sliding in and out of her pussy like the dirt being thrown on her. <clears throat> it's not just oh, it's not just the libraries promoting this to kids. On the back cover of this book, Simon & Schuster's Say there are publishers behind it, and they list a, a, a website you can go to for kids to get the hottest books, the latest teen books that, that uh, appeal to these kids. Pornographic content used to be targeted to adults, not anymore. The question is not the existence of these books, but what are we going to do about it? Blockbuster video stores have a separate area for pornography and sexually explicit material. Movie theaters check IDs to prevent children under 17 and do X and R rated movies. Is there anything in place here? to keep a child from ordering an obscene library, library book online. Public libraries supported by tax dollars should have, also have these safeguards in place. PBS is all funded by, also funded by my taxpayer dollars to promote education and learning like Sesame Street and Rick Steves Europe. But you won't be finding a late night showing of Deep Throat on their schedule because of FCC regulations. On May 16th, my family and I, and many of my friends will be voting to replace Regina McRae and Judy Meyer with conservatives who will begin the process of regulating obscene marriage materials and keeping these books out of the hands of children and teens. And Ernie. Dan Carnell and Post Fault. Mm -hmm. CLN's material selection policy states, quote, the responsibility for use of library materials by minors rests with their parents or legal guardians. 
So how can parents make responsible decisions about potential harm? Informed consent. This brings me to my main point. Why is my 10 year old daughter be able to access sexually explicit books without my informed consent? The book Beyond Magenta in the juvenile section was recently issued to my child, quote, there was sex, what I would call curiosity sex. We were experimenting. Isn't that what a kid does at that age? She prances around singing, I fucked a man up. Go get your pussy the fuck off the train. I was sexually mature. From six up, I used to kiss other guys in my neighborhood and perform oral sex on them. I liked it. See on board, are parents clearly informed when they apply for their minor children's cars that their kids will have free access to this type of content? I sure wasn't. How about including these quotes on the application instead of the ambiguous fine print? The second book was issued to my daughter via interlibrary loan. I know it's not part of your network, but bear with me for a moment. If there was a molester threatening your child, would it, you only act if he was in your quote, network? This book molests the mind. Gender Queer contains graphic images of masturbation, oral sex, and intercourse. Quote, Normally, I got up once while driving just by rubbing the front of my jeans and imagining getting a blow job. Seal and Bart is your hands off ILL policy, a convenient loophole allowing librarians to innocently say, no, we don't carry those books, while shattering kids' innocence under the table. Grooming laws exist because the data is clear that giving sexually explicit content to minors is harmful. Based on prior comments given at these meetings, many seem ignorant or in denial. Instead of constructing carefully crafted, crafted legal blather about exemptions and quote, free speech, instead make sure that you first do no harm. Is there any chance that the seeds of promiscuity, deviancy, drugs, and self-harm glamorized in these books could ripen into STDs, teen, pregnancy, addiction, violence, or suicide? Understand that legality does not equal morality. A groomer with an exemption is still a groomer. There is a solution that protects minors while maintaining full access to parents who still want this trash. Informed consent. Require express parental permission for explicit content, including ILL. There are only two reasons to deny it. One, either to enable minors to sneak behind their parents' backs, or two, to enable you to groom them behind their parents' backs. If you truly support parental choice, you will also support informed consent. If you are unable Thank you. to do so, you're going you. parents decide policy is a travesty and you are a hypocrite. That's Thank you. <laughs> Michelle Lippert. <laughs> My name is Michelle Lippert. I've been a resident of Post Falls since 1988. First, I would like to thank you for your service. I've attended countless public meetings, usually dull affairs. This has changed in the last couple of years. You have my admiration. I'm a retired philosophy professor, so this is going to get a little philosophical. I read the CDA press Tuesday morning, was stunned to learn that Ferdinand the Bull was a book on the list to be removed from libraries. We owned that book. I read that book to my sons many times. A quick internet search showed that some people believe that Ferdinand the Bull is about gender fluidity. That never occurred to me. The philosopher Paul Ricoeur wrote about art. He says that when art is created, the artist has an intent, but art takes on a life of its own. Each observer of art brings their own interpretation, and each interpretation is valid. Everyone who sees the Mona Lisa has a unique experience. The Danish philosopher Kierkegaard held a similar view. He argued that subjectivity is truth. He was somewhat obsessed by his personal relationship with God. While he firmly believed in the existence of only one God, he also believed that every person's experience of God was profoundly personal. We experience God subjectively, therefore all experiences are different, and there is no single interpretation of God. Okay, so back to Ferdinand. Literature is art. 
Our experience with Ferdinand is unique. There is no one single correct interpretation. Literature is experienced subjectively. My, um, my experience is not yours. My life is not identical to yours. I am not you. We will see these differently. Some may see Ferdinand the Bull as a story about gender fluidity. I saw it as a story of a, of a bull choosing flowers over violence. Please create a rich, diverse collection. The population of Kootenai County is diverse. Know that there will be different experiences with each book in your collection. There are over 160,000 people in Kootenai County. If all 160,000 had to approve every book, there would be no libraries. But it's libraries with their different books and different interpretation that inspire thought. And it is thoughtful people who will get us through our current difficulties and keep our libraries open. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more? Good afternoon. I'm from Hayden, Kenny Moore, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. I went to your, your uh, board meeting last month in the Hayden Library, and I've got a couple of comments about that. But first, <clears throat> I grew up in a very small town, about 6,000, the county seat, the largest place in the county. They had one library in the county, and they had two rooms that you could put in this room with a library in it. And I read 3,017 books during my years before I became 17 and left that town. And uh, it was a great thing for me. It was a wonderful thing for me. And it uh, filled up most of my spare time when I wasn't doing other things. <laughs> Second issue, we went to your library meeting in Hayden last month. And it was amazing. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. I go to the Hayden Library often, and I looked at the shelves in the youth section, and all these books, these 407 books that they had in their library were on display until the night of the library meeting, and they were moved. They weren't there. Somebody took them down and put them where they couldn't be found. They weren't even on the shelves that night. Thank you for that. If you're upfront about things, be upfront. Second thing, uh, we had a man that went to the Hayden Library back in uh, December of last year. And they had a special meeting there. And they're in their meeting room, which your written library regulations say, anybody that has a library card can come into that meeting. You didn't allow adults in, you didn't allow parents in. First thing you did, you had 10 year olds to 13 year olds, and then you got 13 year olds and 16 year olds in that meeting, who was in charge of what happened? I don't know but they wouldn't let people in. One of our people went to the meeting and would not move away from it, and they called the police and arrested him, illegally, by the way. And uh, I don't know what was going on with the 13-year-olds and 16-year-olds, between 13 and 16, or the 10 to 13-year-olds. Were you having training sessions there? I have no idea. But your job is to protect our children and the destiny of this country. Do your job and do not allow pornography and this illicit stuff to do it. By the way, I read three of the books on those 405 the other day. I only got past page four or five of them. Every single one of them promoted the same thing. You know what it was? Let's get into drugs first, and then we then all inhibitions are lowered in children and everything else happens. That happened in every single book. You should be ashamed of yourself for a while on that in this library. So. Um, Heather Greenman. Yes. Um. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to set a timer for myself starting now. Thank you. I warn this book is pornographic for those who do not want to be exposed. You say that you have not moved any books since the new materials policy, i.e. porn, and that you must look at material as a whole, not individual passages when deciding if a book is pornographic and should be in the minor section. Pacific Justice Institute sent you a letter encouraging you, you can move these books from the minor section. Porn is porn. Respectfully, here is an example to help you understand and appeal to your conscience and common sense. It's like the library taking a glass of water with a piece of poop in it, as demonstrated by my candy bar, then saying to the kids and their parents, there's only a piece of poop in it, so therefore it's still good to drink. Would anyone here drink water with poop in it? Why then would you think it's okay to give kids books with porn, however big or small? Now, this book, A Court of Silver Flames, is more like 64 pieces of poop loaded into the water for our kids to consume. 64 pages of explicit, mostly pornographic content is labeled adolescent in the system, and it is uh, available for kids as young as 12, has a mix of adult and juvenile placements showing the adult content and is checked out at most libraries. Disturbing excerpts from porn field page 516 to 517. Uh, Nesta ground her aching nipples into the wood surface, savoring the brutal crush. The liquid slide of his cock into her sounded obscenely. His balls brushed against her. Exquisite, punishing thrust slammed so deep he hit her innermost wall and her eyes rolled back into her head. He became savage, unrelenting. Nesta knew she would bruise, loved that she would bruise. I like it when you ride me hard every time my body is sore. I think of you, of your cock. I love being so covered in your seed that it leaks out of me for ages afterward. I love feeling it slide down my thighs and knowing you left your mark in me. He blew out, pounding wildly now. Cassie and came with a roar, pulse of his cock spurting deep into her. His seed was again running down her thighs until he slid his finger through a stream of it and brought it up to the spot at the apex of her sex, smearing his wetness there. The American College of Pediatricians stated June 2016, sexual predators have purposely exposed children to pornography for the purpose of grooming children for sexual exploitation. Let's not make them susceptible to those who would use this exposure to prey upon their innocence. The water is contaminated. Over a year we have asked, we have support the library, just stop giving this to kids. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Josiah Mann, yes. Sorry, my name is Josiah. Uh, just to give you some context about who I am. Oh, I live in Portland, but like right by Hayden, and Hayden is my home library. I am a uh, Regular Army veteran, um, a sometime scholar, and mostly these days, I'm a homemaker. Uh, I help take care of my elderly aunt, my disabled nephew, and my two little nieces. I'm also a photographer, and I volunteer with CDA Act, uh, celebrating different abilities through arts and community theater. Um, all right, I'm going to be a little blunt now. Those leading this attack on the libraries, both locally and nationally, can be directly linked to patriarchal white Christian nationalism. Shut oh, up. Okay, that's enough. And Everybody that's else, that? hang on one sec. Everybody else has been allowed to say what they need to say okay. and read what they need to read. Let this man speak. And do we really want that back in Hayden? Haven't we had enough of that violently exclusionary ideology 30 years ago? Because when you get right down to it, that's what these folks would like. They'd like anyone that deviates from their idea of normative to take their place a little lower on the hierarchical chain of being. 
a little less than fully human, where normatively human means white, heterosexual, patriarchal, <laughs> according to one and only one idea. Okay, I'm going to stop you again. Hang on for the time. We have allowed people to read absolutely awful passages. From no, books. That's enough. That's front of your books. Okay, I get the chance. I we are listening. We are listening to you. Can you please give him the courtesy to listen to him? We have listened. We have listened carefully to everybody. Please let him speak. Thank you. I am only asking you one thing. Please give this man the opportunity to speak that everybody else has received. Everybody, listen to the racist. Give him his moment. Shut up, Sherry. Yeah. You, for you guys, days. enough. Okay. And most definitely Christian and even a very narrow band of understandings of what Christian can mean. Never mind other religions or no religion at all. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about how that intersects with libraries and economies and economies of morality. We're talking about banned books. We sometimes even celebrate the freedom to read banned books. And some of those trying to restrict and exclude books from public libraries might even say they're not trying to get the books actually banned. Since you can still, you know, buy these books, it's not as if they've suddenly gotten publishing houses to stop printing them or anything. But isn't that just saying that you can only sidestep their specific control if you can afford to. That freedom to control what we should read should cost money. That if you're poor and can't afford to buy these books, that you have to submit to their authority and control. I don't like that idea at all. I think it entirely undermines the entire purpose of libraries to open doors and pathways of possibilities to everyone, to level the economic possibilities of access to knowledge, history, science, and literature. By attempting to restrictively control library, I think these folks wittingly or willingly unwittingly saying that poor people don't deserve to be able to control their own moral, ethical and religious choices. Okay, now let's address another small thing here. Very popular topic. Sex, sexuality, gender and teenagers. Yes, there are indeed. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. All right. Anita, thank you very much. Anita. Anita, are you here? Oh, Anita, not Nina, not Nina. I'm sorry. Anita Duke Sick Rackdrum. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. The definition of blush is a reddening of the face, especially from shame, modesty, or confusion, to feel shame or embarrassment. Do we really have no shame or embarrassment in the things that we are inviting our children to read? Our culture has lost its ability to blush. Jesus said about children, <clears throat> but if anyone causes one of these little ones to believe in me, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Matthew 18, 6. It appears that we have become the anyone, and we better be prepared to answer for this. Thank you. Daniel Fry. Thank you for your calm demeanor this entire time. I'm really impressed with this board, your ability to maintain your composure over everything that's been read. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, reach back to the philosopher or the lady that taught philosophy who had talked about uh, subjectivism. And what she had said is basically everybody has their own opinion, their own ability to decide what is right and wrong. With that in mind, the question becomes, why are any of us here? If we have the ability to, to think and choose what morality we want to follow, why should any of us matter what this person says or what this person says or the next person says? Because everybody's opinion is valid and there is no collective will or collective good or evil. It's whatever, whatever anybody wants. So the question then becomes, uh, what is what is the morality we are arguing here? We have two very diametrically opposed uh, uh, situations. We've got an entire side of the room that it is advocating for a uh, moral standard and decency. And we've got an entire other side of the room that is arguing for freedom. I don't think that they're necessarily mutually exclu exclusive. And I think that those arguing for freedom are well within their rights. And I think they're well 
uh, intention in arguing for uh, freedom. The question then becomes, what moral standard is that freedom based upon? What are you basing the the opposition that you have to everybody on this room on? Now, granted, there's a lot of animosity going on here, and there's a lot of anger and hate and biting and that. But the question becomes, you believe that your position is right. Everybody in here believes their position is right. The question is, is what is that position uh, founded upon? What is the moral foundation that justifies your reason to be able to make said judgments and statements? Uh, and so for my position, I'm coming from a Judeo-Christian background. Okay, I'm going to argue that there is an objective moral standard and everybody in here, most everybody over here on this side is probably going to agree that there is an objective moral standard, whereas everybody on this side most likely is going to agree that there's more of a subjective standard. So the question becomes, how can we talk to each other when there is two diametrically opposed ideas, that there is a universal morality, there is no universal morality, that morality is what we choose to make of it. So how do we talk to each other when there is no objective grounding to base this on? This entire idea of what is pornography is completely rooted in this. Without any sort of objective moral standard, there is no idea of, of pornography. Okay, so then when this side is over here uh, making a statement and a proclamation, it is saying that we are basing this on an objective moral standard. That standard is found in the biblical world and in the Bible. On this side, I'm 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 sorry, I'm I'm unfamiliar what your position is based upon, and I'd be happy to understand where that's coming from. Hey, you guys, enough, enough. No, it's it's okay, it's okay. No, it is not okay. It is not okay. I have asked you guys to let people speak. Just listen. I and I'm almost finished, but I would honestly like a dialogue. Actually, what I, I what that, what we do ask is that you address the board and not the audience. That would be helpful. Okay. Well, I said what I needed to say. Thank you all very much. You were very patient. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jane Clark. Hello. Uh, my name is Jane. I'm a multi generation North Idaho native who grew up in the Portland school system. I'm a mother of two school children currently enrolled here. My children enjoy going to the library with their grandmother, and we attend uh, several events. Um, in North Idaho, we value freedom, not only our First and Second Amendment rights, but also the freedom to raise our, our kids the way we choose. People move here because we have choices about vaccinations and schools. I'm not for anything that restricts a parent's right to choose what's right for their own kids. It seems like people move here and then attempt to restrict freedoms, not understanding that if you take it from some, it could be taken from all of us. Because right now, books with LGBT characters are on the chopping block um, because some people don't want to consume that material. If this is allowed, what's next? Topics of homeschooling, vaccinations, religion, science, those topics are not always agreed on. There is already fighting about history and race. The library does not exist to not challenge or offend people. It exists to expand our knowledge of all viewpoints and represent all members of our community. And like it or not, there are LGBTQIA plus uh, children and adults in our community, and they deserve to be represented in our libraries. Books with queer, queer characters do not turn straight kids gay because the reverse isn't true either. Most gay kids never have representation in books as kids. Not every book is for every person, and there's plenty of books I would not want my children to read, but for me, it is for me to choose. Just like the internet and their movie access. I don't want the government or anyone else to choose for me. We've heard a lot of excerpts today from books, but what are worse than those? That there are children in our community and in our state that are experiencing those things, but not because of these books. I think that we can all agree that our children do need protecting. The AG, the Idaho AG, recently released an annual report on child sexual abuse for 2022. And I've been seeing a lot of news reports all the time containing disturbing uh, reports about abuse. And I ask you, do you really think the books are the cause? Because I don't. The demographics of the offenders do not match the narrative of it being drag queens and LGBT people. For the sake of Idaho children, we need to work together to solve the real problems. We need to believe victims and believe and have better victim support. We need stricter punishments for actual offenders. We need mental health support. We need to come together and insist that our legislators address the real offenders and not the LGBT community. Jail sex offenders, not librarians. Thank you. Scott Schofield.
Hi, my name is uh, Scott Schofield, and I was just coming to initially was going to just listen to it, and I thought uh, I wanted to share some things. Um, I want to share a couple <clears throat> different scriptures. It says, um, furthermore, and this is out of Romans chapter one. Furthermore, just that they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so gave them over to a depraved mind so that <clears throat> they uh, do what is not ought to be done. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They were full of murder, strife. And it, it goes on down that, that they, God gave them over and they exchanged the truth for a lie. And I think we need to realize where all of this is born out of. And there's another scripture that says all things are lawful, but not all things benefit. I don't see the benefit of these kind of books to our, to our children. And since there was a number of books read, I'm going to give you a chapter out of the book of Scott Schofield. And my wife hasn't even totally heard the extent of it because I was a little embarrassed to even share it. But I'm going to tell you the story. And maybe it'll open up your mind because I don't even know how we are even here in this day and age. And to have people that are willing to bring these type of materials into the library. And, and I, does, it take, does it take one of your loved ones be, to fall victim? this before you really maybe change your your perspective on things so i want to tell you a little bit of stories i was almost molested at seven years of age i didn't know my relative wanted to sleep with me and in my in innocence i didn't know any difference then during the night he grabbed my hand and put it on his penis and i kept pulling away and he tried several times to put pull down my underwear uh, my backside. I'm 59 years old, and that visual is explicit to, is a visual today, and imprinted on my mind as it was when I was seven years of age. So you don't think that these kids that are experimenting and reading this type of material, that's not going to be imprinted on their mind for the rest of their life. It will. I'm living proof of it, and it actually was a turning point in my life to where I began to get into illicit sex, almost as an older teenager, early 20s, where I was willing even to prostitute myself out. Thank you very much. But you know what? No, it, does it, it take, it's does it done. Take Adam and Eve, there's a place. Go put the stuff done. in another place. It We're done. have to be in Thank the public you. library. Okay? Thank you. In a, in a My name is Nina Beasley. I'm a resident of Rathdrum, and I do have a question for you. How does it make this board feel to know that you're responsible for distributing porn to children? The First Amendment, it is not a blanket for distributing porn to children. That is why we have Title 18 statute in Idaho law. Now, it's illegal for you or I to distribute porn to children, but if you're a library, or a school, you're exempt. So now we've institutionalized harm to children. How does that make you feel? So United Families International, they put out a booklet with peer reviewed research to give to policymakers and legislators. If I was not a religious person, and this is all on pornography, I would go, this causes harm to society. This causes harm to men, women and children. And it shows, the data shows that everywhere obscene material is permitted, murder, rape, child molestation goes up exponentially. So essentially, other people's freedom to read interferes with my freedom to have life and liberty for my children to possibly not, to not be raped. Seriously, so another person's freedom to read this garbage where it shows that rape and murder goes up exponentially, increases the risk that one of my four daughters or my son could be raped. 
could be molested, could be murdered. We had a murder down in Southern California, Southern Idaho, with what two of the ladies were from here. And you know what? I bet if they looked through his files, he was viewing pornography. We had another man that came here that had been charged with crimes against a child, and he said it started with pornography. Ted Bundy, guess what? Jeffrey Dahmer. We have a lot of people that we can name here. It started with pornography. Ted Bundy, before he died, they interviewed him and he said it started with pornography. How does it make you feel to know that you're creating murderers? You're creating rapists. You're creating child molesters. How does that make you feel? And we want to excerpts from books that you can't even tolerate hearing, but then you want to give it to kids. How does that make you feel that you're responsible for that? Okay, um, and our last speaker today is David Fry. Hello, David Fry from Post Falls, new to the area. It's a pretty awesome place and I love it. Two things, there's questions for you guys. Why are you beholden to the ALA as one of the ladies over here talked about? Does the ALA, do they pay for the books here in the library or is that the taxpayers that pay the books? Question, answers from the boards. Are you not an answer? No, no. Okay, that's okay. Not well, just leave that as an open-ended question. So I'm pretty sure that I am correct that the ALA, ALA does not pay for the books in our library. The taxpayers do. What is are the consequences if you tell the ALA we are going to do it our way here in Post Falls in our Idaho area? I'm not saying banning books. I'm saying why do we have to be against a board who's not elected by the people who live here? So the question becomes, is if you say no to the ALA and say, we don't want your stuff, we're going to handle it our way, you have plenty of people and taxpayers who will support you in that. So what I have to say is that basically, you guys need to get rid of the ALA and stop going for them. Stop going on that stuff. And listen to the people who live in the community on both sides, right? You can have a place for them to have their books, whatever it is, like the guy before had talked about the, in a section. If they want it for kids and all that, label it. You have sections that are for history. We can all go through the Dewey Decimal System or the, the Tower Card Catalog, and we can all go look for lesbian and, and gay stuff, and we'll be okay. We can go and look at that. But when it's on display, ask yourself, how often have you put something that's not that on display, such as the Bible, such as Christian things, such as an American thing, such as patriotic things, Let's look at how often those are actually supported and actually put up in those places. I would say it's very little, if at all. So that's what I have to say. Think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of public comment. Everybody is welcome to stay and listen to the rest of our board meeting. Um, and uh, I want to thank you. Pardon? Putting a break. A break, certainly. All right, I'll take a break. All right, may I ask again to please have quiet from the audience so that we can have, go on to our next agenda. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is our post falls annual report from Jennifer Kraft. Thank you. 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 Thank Great. Thanks for every to everybody on the board for being so patient with the, the late delivery of my report. I usually do it in November, December. Things got a little off. 
off schedule, but I'm really pleased to be doing it now in February. Um, this fiscal year 2022 was a challenging year in many ways for um, for the library and the community. So something that I always encourage myself to do and my staff is always be humble and kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to your neighbors, be kind to your coworkers, be kind to your community. Um, so that's this year's, that was my theme this year was always be humble and kind. All right, so I'm gonna dive right in. And as we do every year, my annual report is tied to our strategic plan. So I'll have a slide or two for each of the goals of the strategic plan. But first and foremost, here is the Post Falls Library team. And it's hard for me to go through everybody's names, but um, we do have four shelvers um, there on the left. And then the rest of the staff is in the, the large picture and the, the remaining two. I have a great, really wonderful group of people working here, and they're always very, they, we have great customer service, so I appreciate them all. Oh, there we go. Sorry, jump ahead. All right, so goal one, deliver unique and responsive programs driven by community needs and interests. Uh, programs and meeting room use really rebounded in fiscal year 2022. We had great programs for patrons of all ages, including several intergenerational programs. Uh, popular events included, like on the left, uh, a balloon event. We have a program called Fit and Fall Proof. And that runs twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, let's see, we had Project Neighborly over the summer, which was sponsored by a grant from the Idaho Community Foundation. And also had, uh, we always participate in the Post Falls Parade. And this year we even, two of my colleagues wrote the book bites in the parade, which was pretty cool. And we had the Discovery Bus come several times. And we even did a drive through trick or treat for people who didn't have a whole lot of time, but <laughs> wanted to drive through and at least trick or treat. By the numbers, we had 111 programs for adults with 1600 people in attendance. And of course, you've already heard from our youth services coordinator, coordinator Karen Yelder about all of the amazing things youth services team does. Uh, but here at Post Falls, just again, by the numbers, we had 200 in-house programs that educated over 4,500 kids and their caregivers. And then outside of the library to school visits and daycare centers, uh, they reached over 7,000 kiddos, over 225 outreach visits, which is really amazing in our growing community. Um, we also had our, I believe it's the fourth issue of our teen writing publication, which is called Bell Cadeau. And so that um, I have copies out on the table here for all of our board members. There should be enough, I, a few left over as well. Um, this one was great. I had 22 written submissions and dozens of photos from teens around the area, a lot of submissions from the schools, which was really cool. Goal two, engage strategic partners to leverage shared experience and enhance community services. Post Falls Library had a really lively booth at the annual Post Falls Business Fair last April. Staff was joined by Nick from the Nick and Chris from the Emerging Technologies Department with the Discovery Bus. And they handed out you know, tote bags and gave people library cards and talked about what kind of services we have to provide uh, post falls and other staff from around the district also helped on the discovery bus at the County fair over the summer and they showed off all kinds of cool tech like drones and 3d printing mm -hmm. they handed out there they created library cards and talked about some of our um, electronic resources as well um, my colleague nathan created some really cool posters um, highlighting local history, and those are to draw attention to our ongoing and expanding um, online resource called OurCommunityHistory.net. That's a lot of local history uh, from Rathrum Historical Society, Post Falls Historical Society, um, and 
there's another group who said, I'm sorry, but it was escaping me. Um, in addition to the stakeholders that are listed there that we partner with frequently, Coast Falls also partnered with SPCU, the Disability Action Center, Cancer Warriors Evening of Hope, Humana, Senior Health Insurance Benefits Advisors, and the Alzheimer's Association. Um, with the Cancer Warriors Evening of Hope, we've actually started recording a lot of those sessions when they have guest speakers, so that those events are then made uh, available on our YouTube channel for folks who aren't able to attend in person. Removing barriers to library services and improved customer experience. So we had over 162,000 visitors in fiscal year 22. That's up 66% from the previous year. I mean, there's some obvious reasons there. Um, a lot of people we found out weren't even aware that we were fully open and actually had been for all, all of just about two. I think we were closed for maybe two weeks or sorry, two months during the pandemic, but had been open with services um, during the rest. So a lot of people were realizing again that we were open and coming back. Um, which is great, but there's also a lot of people moving to this area. So Jennifer, is that just post falls, folks? Is it 162? Correct. Just post falls. Yes. Thank you. Uh, circulation has definitely rebounded as well, and significantly in um, children's material, juvenile items being checked out by families. So we saw an increase in the number of homeschool groups that were using the library as well. Sure. So to increase to yeah, I'm sorry to illustrate the increase in juvenile circulation, and that's that big uh, maroon part of that pie there. Um, in September of 2019, there were 88,000 juvenile items checked out. In September of 2019, in September 2021, there were 10,000. September 2022, almost 11,000. So when we wondered. If it felt like we were really, really busy, it's true, we were really, really busy. <laughs> uh, we also added two new databases to the library's um, roster. One is called Niche Academy, one is called LinkedIn Learning, and if you guys haven't checked them out, you should. They're really cool. Both of them, they provide excellent professional training on a wide range of topics. Uh, some are even, even you can get certificates for, which are like web development, leadership training, stress management, car repair, ancestry, um, even college prep. So those those are great new resources. So kind of hard to tell from my little small pictures there, but um, throughout the year we also did some nice improvements to, uh, to the interior of the building. Um, we had floors done, <laughs> which was great. We had the hold shelves. Uh, we had lights installed in the hold shelves so that easier to see. We moved a lot of the shelving around in the new book area so that, that it was more ADA compliant, and that's also just attractive. In the small meeting room, which is behind us, um, the top picture was just sort of a little, um, what would you call it, hodgepodge of local history photos until one of my colleagues came up with the idea of taking this old photo of the Post Falls Library that was here prior to this building and build it blowing it up into a wall sized mural. So if you haven't seen it before, you should definitely look at it. It's really beautiful. We also moved some shelving around in the young adult era, sorry, the children's room so that some of the really popular collections like the graphic novels would have room to grow. Um, somebody donated or left behind that little shopping cart and it's probably the most popular <laughs> piece <laughs> of furniture thing in the children's room. So I just kind of wanted to show some kids interacting with that as well. And so we're always looking for ways to improve um, the space, make it more cheerful, more colorful, um, improve sight lines, et cetera. So that's that's an ongoing project. OK, now goals four and five have a lot um, a lot to do with more district wide like communication efforts and facilities. Um, strategies, and I know you've heard you already heard from Christy Elstrom, our communications coordinator, about her efforts. Um, but a couple of things I wanted to point out that we really like here, the staff at Post Falls, is that on our website, uh, Diane, the webmaster, has now started highlighting specific services. Like, hey, did you know you can 
um, what do you call it, reserve a meeting space. Are you interested in learning about 3D printing? So those will kind of scroll through the website. Um, and we think that that's pretty nifty to draw attention to some of the uh, non-book related services that they can access on our website. And we are still adding content to our YouTube channel. So it's still getting a lot of traction. We have over 100 videos there. And, <laughs> and to date, since its inception, 45,000 views. So that is still a place where people can find out a lot of good information, see some fun videos, hear some blog posts. Hey. I'm sorry, let me. OK, build community library network infrastructure and capacity. So I'm pleased that the compensation plan strategy has moved forward. Uh, thanks to the tremendous efforts of you all on the board and the admin team. Now, I know there's more work to be done in the area of compensation, but at least I was really pleased that the folks on our staff who had been well under market rate in pay finally got a raise this year. Um, so look forward to see, seeing what round two of that looks like. And district staff was able to attend a couple of uh, training opportunities. We have all staff day usually every year. And this year, so all staff day is just that. It's all staff from around the district. This year, several members of our board were able to attend as well. Uh, it's a nice chance to see colleagues from around the district and uh, topics, um, learning sessions that we participated in this year included the impact of stress on teams, updates from local law enforcement officials, and some of us actually had an opportunity to take a uh, guided nature hike in uh, Camillan Park, which was pretty cool. In March, some of us throughout the district attended the Public Library Association Conference in Portland. Um, it's a great opportunity to connect with librarians from around the country who are facing similar um, challenges and rewards. Uh, I also was able to visit a few vendor sites to give us help give us some ideas for uh, furniture and paint and so forth for the children's room renovation, which is uh, I mentioned this at my last board meeting, and I want to let you guys know that we are still moving forward with that. We um, have some architectural renderings that are in the works, and I really hope that that starts this year and that by this time next year, I have more to share with you on that. And last but not least, this lovely little note came through our book drop one day, and I just thought it was <laughs> too sweet to pass up. So I had to snap a picture of it and share it with you all. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any questions? Yes. Let me turn the lights on. Yeah. Is this it? Mm -hmm. Just. Forget it. <laughs> That's what we do. No. It's just the round button. Oh. oh. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Questions? Board members? Thank you for going on now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's helpful to have you show the pictures of things that you're seeing and working on and tie it to the strategic plan. That's, I think it helps us and the board then understand the importance of the strategic, uh, strategic plan. Uh, and the fact that, that uh, for me, having you connect to the history group is particularly fun because I think that helps give people a sense of place. Uh, and it's just another neat service that you provide. So. That was one that caught my attention. Otherwise, I think uh, see here the growth and numbers helps me quantify what it is we're doing and achieving. Again, thinking about budgeting coming up next, all the growth, how will we keep up with it? Nice problem to have. Any other, anybody else? Um, I was going to ask you about the children's, but you and you said something about about the children's department and oh. and and that's moving forward. That's great. Yeah, it is moving forward. I mean, it's been slow because there are so many building projects happening in in our communities that 
you know, it's slow to get people and you can talk about it. And again, that's you know probably a good problem to have. But <laughs> you know, the growth is so great. But um we we are definitely moving forward with it and that's great. That's good. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, how are we doing on staff turnover? We talked about compensation. Um, and we've been through a lot of staff turnover. Are we able to retain people that you've worked hard to train and tune up? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, we go through cycles, I think. Um, but not good. It's been pretty stable for. And is your sense that we have a career paths for people so that they feel like they have an opportunity to grow within our system? Not enough. Not enough. Yeah. There are very few full time or per se eligible positions, and I think people would. I think. I think we could have. That. And that's what I'm asking for in terms of, of the conversation plan we're looking at and learning more about and looking at the job market as a whole. Salaries for any position anymore, anywhere. Are increasing a lot. Yeah. So hard to make ends meet in an expensive area with a lot of part time. Part time. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that may be one that you can and continue to educate us about okay. what you find folks fall. Your geography thinks that folks can makes a comparison, I think, even greater than geography Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. I, I just no no questions, and this is probably very prejudicial since it's my home library for decades and decades. But awesome staff. Um, I'm in sometimes three times a week, um, and it's not so important the interactions I have with the staff, which are always great. But I get the chance to see what's happening elsewhere. Wonderful. Okay, that sounds good. So we're ready to move on to the rest of our agenda. And I'm sure I had a question. We have a new agenda that was handed to us here at the meeting, right? Yes. Yep. And on that agenda, um, further on the back side of this page, at least, is a public comment will review time. And that's one I'm wondering if we can move up to uh, after. Well, after this report, before we do the consent agenda or after the consent agenda, just so we can talk about it before the end of the meeting. So you're asking, what you're asking for is to have the public comment overview time moved up to the, is there yeah. a reason? That's the more, but no, that <laughs> actually is, is because I think um, there's some discussion we need to work, I need to have, and I would like to have that earlier in the meeting so we can Think about it as possible. Okay. Uh, is that okay with the rest of you? Where do you want it moved to? Um, right now, at the end of the report, to me, felt good because we just heard about one of the branches. Uh, I was going to tell them a compliment on that and then, then uh, talk about some of the other common issues that we're here thinking about from last month. So, you so she's happy. asking to have it now, yeah. to move it now, or to move it after the consent agenda. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. What then might as well have it now. Okay. Because for, for me, uh, hearing the good things that the uh, Post Hall branch is doing um, reconfirms why we have board meetings and sometimes we they are difficult. But it's important that that uh, not only the comments this time, which we do not respond to. Well, the comments I was reading about for the uh, January meeting, meeting minutes, which we'll be approving shortly, reminded me again how much the community cares about our libraries. The challenge of meeting all of these is hard, and I think as the board member, I want to be sure to hear those public comments. And over the last couple of months, we've got a theme going here. Um, and I want to see if there's some ways that we as a board can talk about uh, recognizing uh, Themes that we're hearing. As I thought about this a bit and to talk with you all, it was one of, man, have things changed in the context of what a library has from when I was in, using the library or our kids were, and our culture changed. And so I'm having to get used to some of that. 
even with what the contents are on the internet, no less what they are in the library or on the grocery store magazine stand anymore. And I remember when our kids were little and stand there and read the magazine, we go, let's see, let's not read that one, let's talk about something else. And they go off and choose candy bars instead. But anyway, for, for me, I wanted to talk with my fellow board members about the proportion of books that are causing concern. I think, Lindsay, am I reading right or remembering that somewhere out of our 100% collection, about one or two percent is in the children's area that's causing so much concern? And maybe that's adults too. I, I need to learn about those categories. Um, let me think about this. Um, so our collection is divided into children's, yes. young adult, and adult. And so are you asking about items that are identified as LGBTQ or what are you asking? No, I'm because I'm not sure that I want to categorize all the concerns folks have, but we have folks concerned about what's in children's library section particularly. And as a percentage of our collection, what amount of that number is it? One percent, half our collection is in children's. It's one I think one time I thought I heard you say about one one or two percent. So um I so in children's there's less than one percent of our collection that falls into I think what you're asking about which is just a number of books not the topics just the number of books that we have in the children's section right is less than one percent when you're talking children what do you, um yeah um from z age zero to eleven okay zero to eleven okay because I think one of the things we might want to think about as a board is is uh, how we categorize children age, then thing with the young adult. Some of the things we've been hearing have said there's concern between young adults, which is age 12 to 18. Am I, yes, that, that is young adult. Which is about how we do it. Uh, and so for today, uh, thinking about uh, my getting you to, to uh, a culture that has a lot more openness to it than I was accustomed to, but it's the way it is these days, and the younger generations are uh, approaching things differently. So I need to allow for that to happen. But I need to also figure out how we can empower parents to help those little, littlest ones of all, which is from, 11, from 0 to 11, perhaps, but maybe more than that. I don't know exactly, but I wanted to try out on, on board members um, what we might ask our staff to do to help us figure out ways to get those parents more involved or options to involve. Some parents won't ever come. They'll drop their kids off. I remember years ago, I was guilty of that a couple of times because we were building a building and they'd rather, they got done, done driving trucks in the dirt and they wanted to go to the library. Uh, and I did drop them off the hotel and pick them up and they had a great time. And I felt safe doing that. So uh, I don't know, Lindsay, if you can comment now or we board members need to talk more about what should we do, what could we do to look at, for instance, uh, what I've learned a little bit about is called a juvenile card. Uh, there is such a thing. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot today because I've just been thinking about it. But is there some way you staff can come back to us with what we've seen other libraries do? What you feel is right for our library? That's really what we're talking about. What's best for our library patrons? And uh, uh, I think there's an opt-in and opt-out kind of card where the parents can have some role in that. I mean, if I I can just give Please. you a little bit of information, uh -huh. but I would need to come back with oh, sure. more information. But there are other library systems that have what's called a juvenile only card. Juvenile you know, only. So what does that mean? And so what that means is the parent, um, when they are getting the library card or at any time when the child has the card. Or you could change your card. Yes, they can um, request that the child only check out things that are in that zero to 11 years old range. Um, and so the system would automatically limit what is check outable on that card. Even if the parent's not with them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, so if a child had a young adult or adult book, they would come and there would get an error message if they tried to check it out. And yes. staff wouldn't be able to override that. And so fellow board members, I'm not, I don't want to put Lindsay on the spot, but are these ways that we would should or could consider as ways to help those parents uh, have uh, more input and control. And I don't mind young young little kids having more control. So 
I want to try that out and then the adult section is another issue, but let's try this one first. Is this is anybody else's concern? I, I think what a concern with that might be is that one of the things we're hearing is um, that even in that juvenile section, there's books that are questionable. Okay. So I don't know if that would be a fix if there's books in that section. And I'm just coming from yep. what I've been what I hear. Uh, I don't check out those books. <laughs> I read a little above that, but uh, uh, I don't know if that would be a solution if if people think that there's inappropriate books in that section already. There may be a couple of issues here. In other words, there may be not a single fix. There may be a couple of ways mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. to reconfigure things. So we may have two issues here. One is would a juvenile card be something we'd look at? Number two, what else? What else mm -hmm. would we look at? I think it would be a step in the right direction. It's probably not like the whole fix. But right. Yeah. Right. That's what I don't think that there's a whole fix, you know, a, a, like mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, one of the things I would like to have you guys uh, remember is that we have this enormous board meeting as well. But I want to do this. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it was several months ago I asked for a response to public comment be included on our agenda so that we would be able to have an opportunity to respond to some of the things that are said. Not, I am not responding to things that were said today. I'm responding to things that were said last month. And um, where I want to start is to remind the public that all of us that sit on this board are volunteers. Uh, we bring our unique experiences and backgrounds with us to this board, but we are not librarians. Uh, we are not trained librarians. I don't know how to run a library. I don't profess to, to know how to run a library. Um, I'm an attorney. I have a full-time job. I have two children at home. This is not, you know, I don't live, breathe, and sleep libraries. So um, over the tenure um, during which we had our last director, we have seen what I would call vitriol fueled accusations being levied at our staff, including sexualizing children and indicating that our librarians are engaged in grooming. I have been on this board for six years, but not only that, I've been a user of this library system for many, many years before that. And I see our staff as hardworking, caring people. So I've had a really hard time, as I have over the last um, year with our director who left us, um, hearing, hearing what people were trying to say through the accusations that our library is an evil place that's not safe for children, because I personally don't believe that. I don't believe that our libraries are scary places that Where's are. Mommy? Okay, I don't want to hear anything from the, the audience. It is our time now. You are welcome to stay if you can be quiet. I don't believe the library is a scary place for children. I believe the staff are caring people doing the right, doing, trying to do the right thing. So I don't believe that the staff have deserved the inflammatory and incendiary rhetoric that we continue to hear at board meetings. And my inclination up to this date has been to defer to staff. As an attorney, I am an exceedingly cautious person. I require thorough information and evaluation and time to review and evaluate certain issues. I have sat with this issue for a long time and it has been, I will confess, it has been difficult mm -hmm. to discern the root issue when we have such rampant misrepresentations being made. For example, in trying to correct misinformation last month, I am now being painted as being okay with porn pornography so long as it's in the young adult section. I never said that. Those were not my words. I did not say that I am okay with pornography as long as it's in adolescent and not children's. All I was, the point I was trying to make is there's a clear demarcation between the children's section and the young adult section. What I'm trying to say today in response to public comment, um, and I think it's was was also brought home to me and caught 
my attention was the um, November 2022 election when several legislators were unseated and the library the library was used as a talking point and the message in that um, talking point is that you can't trust the library the library is trying to take away the innocence of our children and I have stated at prior public meetings and I will state again here today I believe in protecting children and we the board have been exploring and researching ways to do that I hear the public saying and I hear the parents saying they don't feel like they have the tools they need and simultaneously we have the legislature looking again at measures that would affect library staff. I propose that we get ahead of these things so that our legislators don't feel the need to criminalize um, or, or try to put in sanctions against librarians. Um, so I, I'm stating that I hear the concerns and I want to empower parents to have the tools that they need to feel that they can trust their library system. I am in support of coming of of asking our staff to research a children's card that parents can select for their child to have a children's card. The children's card would be limited for those children would only be able to check books out that are in the catalog as coded as juvenile. And if you don't want your child to have the children's card, well, then you won't have to have your child have a children's card. I think that that's a, a feasible thing. I have, I have, as I have sat and wrestled with this issue, I have talked to the board chair, and I, I reached out to Lindsay this last month and and talked with her at length, trying to um, understand ways that we can respond to the public through policy and empower parents or give parents the empowerment it, it is that they say that they want. Um, also, um, I have asked to be shown what the books are that people have difficulties with. Over the last two months, I have read um, at least one of the books that was challenged by Liz Wooster. And I am here to tell you, I agree. That book has sexually explicit content that I would not want my 13 year old to go and get off the shelf. Um, I share, I, I see the concern. I, it has taken me a long time, but I see it. And I would like our staff to reevaluate the classifications that are given um, to certain books. And I would like us to consider whether we could have a section that is middle reader or that is tween or some divide between um, children's and young adult because you see that in bookstores you see middle what what they call middle reader and you you can have a tween section so i would like staff to look at that i would like staff to look at can we have a children's card can we possibly make some changes to the collection and then even though we passed it just two months ago, or maybe it was three months ago in November, our material selection policy, this board member is willing to have that come back if need be um, to see if there are additional measures that we can implement to protect children. One of those being um, the current policy is that when there is a challenge, the material stays on the shelf. However, I understand from the library staff that whenever there is a question as to whether something should be in children's or something should be in young adult, they always air up. They always put it in the higher section. So even though our policy indicates that if there's a challenge, the material stays on the shelf, perhaps we could consider that if it's a challenge to a juvenile book or to a young adult book, that we err on the side of protecting the, the children and that book more challenge material is removed during the pendency of the reconsideration process. This is just food for thought for staff um, that possibly we have that policy come come up to us again so that we could maybe beef up um, that policy to include additional measures that we could take to protect children. Because as we have been trying to say, um, this is not a board that 
is interested in sexualizing children. I am offended when that terminology is used, when it is applied to staff, and I am offended when it is applied to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, may I ask a process question? No, I'm sorry. We are not taking anything from the audience. That for the rest of the evening? Yes. Okay, for the thank rest, you. Yes. Um, it, we take information, we take comments during public comment time, and the rest of it is you're welcome to stay and listen. Madam Chair, uh, we need to remind folks this is a meeting of the board. Which way am I? Thank you. This is the meeting of the board in a public setting, but it's not a time for the public to participate. It is not just our board. This is a typical uh, any uh, agency board has to have that process or you can't get your board meeting done. All right. Other comments mm -hmm. by board members? Um, Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was just shared is a lot of information and um, um, my librarian um, sense is that a juvenile only card is the best and most sensible. Um, I have great concern about creating a new classification and I'm happy to go over this in much more detail next month, but some of our libraries are very small and mm -hmm. asking us to create yet another separate section literally could just mean one shelf over. And I don't know that that will accomplish the goal, but I'm willing to look at that. And um, I have a great concern about pulling an item during the reconsideration process because the reconsideration is one person's opinion, and we would be removing books based on that, even though it's temporarily on one person's opinion, not the opinion of the community. So I would, um, that is not a standard or best practice, but I'm more than happy to look into that to see if other places do that. And as I said earlier, a juvenile only card could work. It will take a lot of work on the back end, which is fine. It just is not something that's happening in a month. This is a multi-month process and will involve many stakeholders within the library behind the scenes. Um, one of my concerns is the thing that I keep hammering away at is that we govern by policy. And one of the things is that we're looking at adjusting policies and I'm not even sure how we do that. I'm not, um, and I think that there's some discussion that needs to happen and I don't have a problem with um, I, with, with having it quickly, uh, doing it quickly. Um, one of my concerns as well is um, we've heard a lot about content, you know, that is, very deeply concerning and I would like us to address that too and I'm not certain how you do that without you know within library law and um, so I'm wondering what you guys think about a special meeting for this this would give Lindsay some time to evaluate um, uh, well, first of all what a juvenile part I mean you can, you don't just turn around tomorrow and do it there's a tremendous amount to be done in terms of um, background or catalog, et cetera, which I don't know about. I don't know anything about. Um, what would you guys think about trying to find toward the end of the meeting a special meeting time? We are going to have to have a special meeting um, in order to uh, have a candidate discussion. We might be able to pack those two things together, and that's within the next few weeks. I mean, I can definitely do my best to gather some of this information in time for a meeting like that. Okay. All right. And I'll see that um, we need to be respectful of all you're trying to do on an interim basis. Same with the board. We're scrambling to be sure we get a, a new director. Uh, and, and that is in the works, which is good. On the other hand, um, I think the, the uh, idea of maybe at least prioritizing to help you focus on which one first sort of thing. And for me, it was looking at a juvenile card. How is it done elsewhere? What can we learn from other folks? So I don't want you to invent, invent the card or the wheel. But that, to me, 
made sense as a way to begin to listen to this community where we are board members to represent the community for um, helping parents deal with that issue. And then comes the content about what is someone they're going to have to deal with. That's to me almost another level. In the meantime, and we've got a couple of issues here. That's what I'm right. saying. And I, what I would like to do is maybe tackle a couple, not just limit it to one, because I don't think that one is going to. It's wrapped into it so many, so much. Yeah, effort. I agree. No, I'm just trying to help prioritize because there's um, so much to be done. And I think we as a board, I don't know, I haven't heard from, from a fellow, two other board members earlier who said it made sense for you. Is this something we as a board want to ask our staff to spend time on? Or if you think it's not useful, board members, we need to know that now, not to launch your staff on more content. No, I think this absolutely uh, would be worth it. It's obviously a lot of work. I understand, you know, mm -hmm. it's all computers and, uh, but no, that would be a really great starting point. And then, uh, and, and Katie, I'm not sure what you meant by uh, when you said bringing up the policy again that you were like are you against us revisiting the policy no no that's exactly what i'd like us to okay do. you know yeah, i think like that'd be a great idea and even with the um removing the book during mm -hmm. that's something if as a board you would decide mm -hmm. uh, and then it would be followed mm -hmm. uh but that i don't know how everybody feels about that but that's yeah. something that that's would be a, yeah added i think that to the right. policy if we decided that all right, so in the interest of time and us moving on, when we get to spe setting special meeting dates, we will look at that in addition to the other special meeting that we're going to have to. Is that acceptable? Did that work? Yes. 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 And All thank right. you for giving us a minute to start now to think about it. Okay. All right. He's thinking. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that is correct. Stay with us and we don't leave now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next item on the agenda then is the consent agenda. Um, don't dial, guys. <laughs> I, I didn't find I didn't find anything. Right. And yes, I read it all. <laughs> yeah. I had lots of comments about it, but I'm gonna show I'm gonna save all of them and I'll just move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Okay, we, uh, it's been moved to accept the consent agenda as presented. Is there any more discussion? We need a second on that. No, nope, we don't second. We uh, work by small board rules. Um, and um, I just want to say this is the first month that our consent agenda does not include the report. The reports are down, and we will get to comment on them. But but I'm assuming that that um, it, so that we can now put our whole board packet online. And uh, can I just say that we do have the packet online? Um, so this is the first month that we did that. So it's everything that's in the business section and then anything that there would have been an action item for. So thank you so much. That was quick. <laughs> yeah, that was really quick. All right. So it's been moved um, to accept the consent agenda. All, the, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good. And then the next item on the agenda is a community, community library network January 2023 financial statement. Discussion and or if you want to start it out with a motion. I'll do that, Madam Chair. Move that we accept the January 20, January 23 financial statement. OK, it's been moved to accept the January 2023 financial statement. Is there discussion? Does, does the staff have anything they'd like to highlight? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. If yeah. you had something. If I were the staff, I would highlight yeah. that we might be the only public entity in Kootenai County whose liability insurance premiums have gone down. <laughs> <laughs> what page is that? That's on page three of the um, detail. Yeah. Halfway down the page. No, I'm in, I'm not in the financial statements. I'm in the description. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Any more comments? Well, let's just keep our liability down and not expose ourselves to clients, and we'll be sold. All right. 
Uh, any more discussion? If not, all right, it's been moved to accept the Community Library Network financial statements for January 2023. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Um, FY23 budget, did you want to highlight that? Maybe? Was that just handed out to us? That was in our packet. I, I had asked for that because it changed, so I wanted a updated one. Yeah. Yes, so Janelle um, updated, and this is the board approved amended budget from last month's yeah. meeting. So it's a clean copy with everything that was approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for doing that. That is really helpful. Okie doke. Um, <clears throat> Then next on the agenda is the Community Library Network Gen January 2023 report. And this is an opportunity for you guys to comment. We don't um, we don't have any motion on this. Oh. It's an opportunity for you to comment on the cool no, I, reports that I, you I, like. I'm confused for a second. <laughs> Great pictures this time. It, it just always, it just made me happy that they're not taken out and just so it could be published. So, and what about this? This um, that'll come. That's coming. Is it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else on the report? Rochelle? Um, I like some of the programs. The uh, the entrepreneur, uh, small business, not very little resources. Not my very job. I think I made a comment on that before. Um, that was page yeah. eight. On page ten, there's a adult writers club for twenty something to seventy something. That was a good way to integrate different pages. And on page 13, it says we have a new uh, adult programmer. Um, who is that again? The assistant. Is that what it is? is oh, that? is this uh, is this at Pinehurst? I think. It's yeah. Pine yeah. Um, yeah. We just had a vacancy, so they filled the vacancy with a part-time circulation specialist and adult programmer. Um, I know we have the uh, period of time, but we need to take time to marvel at all the good programs that are being done. And I think we don't want to lose sight of that with all the good things that are happening. I particularly like page three where we had intergenerational activities. So I think that's a whole community outreach that nationwide is becoming more of a theme. And I'm glad that we're right in the middle of it. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Good. I think that we'll get used to this new setup and move forward. Um, all right, circulation statistics. Did we did we miss it? You guys got it. I didn't. It's I'm, a little tiny sheet that was like stuck. I can give you my copy. If oh no, no, I got it. It's stuck. I bet. Well, it should have been right. Yeah, just take this one and sign. Thank you. Um. Put it on I can just highlight a few things. Um, we've had an almost 9% increase in our total circulation from last year to date, 9%. We've had a 12% increase in internet and computer use compared to last year. We've had a 6.5% increase in new patrons this year to date. And we've had a 15% increase in people coming into the library. So that's the people counter portion. And we've had almost 200% more people attend our adult programs compared to last year. So I think that we're doing quite excellent based on those numbers. Thank you for yeah, figuring that yeah. out. Yeah, that is really helpful when you when you do that really helpful i mean i can you can see it but um i love to be talked to like that. <laughs> <laughs> i'll remember that <laughs> well madam sure i think it's important that we help quantify what we're doing and putting numbers by it just helps us measure uh because again it was budgeting we'll have to figure out which ones have uh that's how you say it sometimes in a business paid the rent they've earned enough they're good enough that they stay and others we may want to regroup on or you'll bring us ideas about this didn't work out so well so let's try another way so thank you for quantifying it okay is everybody ready to move on all right the next item on the agenda is the annual report and that that's it you're, you're this is it 
And did you want to talk about it? Sure. Um, so this is a new document that was created that's really just a snapshot of who we are. So anyone who is new to the area or if we're giving a presentation or outreach, we can just share this very quickly to show who we are. Um, our communications department created it and it's been posted to our website so people can look at it and then we'll have it in our libraries for distribution. But it's literally just, it shows what we've accomplished this year, how many people we serve and how we're partnering in the community. And then there's a map on the back with our locations and a brief statement from myself and Katie. So it's just a quick get to know the district and what we accomplished. And ultimately this will be redone every year. So there's new information for the next fiscal year. So, nice. oh, sorry, but I really wanted to ask about this. Go. This is something that's new then. Yes, it had, to my knowledge, this did not exist. Okay, I absolutely love it. Okay. I love it. Um, the, all the information is just like right there. Um, and everybody likes to read this kind of information. So. Uh, whoever designed it and created it, um, I think they did a really good job. I'll pass that on. My only note on only tell more on this other one. That will that will that will wreck it. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 people will read this. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. I would yeah. highlight the, the map. I think that's a, a good graphic. Because part of our magic is is the accessibility that everybody has. You identify that you're putting it in the library for folks that come to the library to pick it up and see it mm -hmm. and know it. How else are we telling our folks that don't get to the library? All of I mean, it, um, it will be pushed out on social media, and I'm sure there are other ways that we can do that. I don't have a plan for that right now. And our communications, man, our coordinator is out on leave. Um, so, But you have it on our list for when she comes back. Yes. <laughs> I bet our list is long. I know. <laughs> Anybody, anybody else want to say anything about it? Well, I was going to ask, am I skimming it? We don't have a, a description of what it costs per book or some quantification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there are different ways about what costs are, but but I think uh, what the library budget spends and how many materials we have shouldn't even be just books. It should be the, the other things in the collection. Some way to begin to say to folks, you don't need to go to the bookstore to buy it. Look what you have here. So like a financial statistic relating to the benefit of the library? Yep, cost benefit is what we're all struggling to make happen. And I'm not sure quite how. I just was thinking one thing was look at we're the second largest library in the state and we serve more people and have more children's programs than anybody else does. Uh, so when you do some of those comparisons with the state charts, it's there. Nothing wrong with bringing them bragging. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Anybody else? All right. Next, the next item on the agenda is the director's report. Yes. So, um, in my actual written report, I just sort of explained our reconsideration process. Um, we have received seven reconsiderations since last month's board meeting, and. Um, I don't know that I need to go over all of this right now, but we just essentially each book has a team of three librarians and we read the book in the entirety and then we research and formulate the final decision that is then presented to the um, individual that submitted the reconsideration. Um, so that just outlines for you what we do. And um, I, let's see. Oh, and so then Janelle and I um, are working on training for staff because um, we're not uh, going to have our staff day like we did last spring. We're going to probably have it in the fall once the new director is here. But in the meantime, we've organized a, a two hour all staff training on de-escalation and um, frontline library staff handling customers. And I think that will be really helpful. And then we also have um, staff, everyone will be attending a first aid and um, CPR class. So we're doing some little trainings here and there, but it's not yet a full staff day. Um, and I do, I, I have like 
a mixed feelings about if I want to share this or not, but um, I just want you guys to know that I am more than happy to work with the board and um, come up with tools that we can show and make our library better for our community. Um, I also just want to say that it's extremely busy right now. Like I'm doing my job and the director's job and we have had seven public records requests, which is more than we've had in I don't know how many years. And that's just since the beginning of this year. We have the seven reconsiderations. We're doing the beginning of our next year's budget planning right now. Um, we have staff performance evaluations and Janelle and I will be onboarding our new director when that happens. And there are also going to be two of our coordinators that become vacant in April. And I would normally take on the duties of those as the assistant director, but right now I don't have the ability to do that. So I'm looking for how we can solve those vacancy issues in the interim. Um, but there is, I, I don't wanna say this to have sympathy or to complain. I'm just trying to create a picture of the reality of what we're doing. <laughs> and it is a lot and, um, so it's establishing priorities and what can wait, what needs to be done immediately, and then how can we help the library move forward and respond to the community. So I just wanted to share that with you. I don't know if you have any questions or. Yeah, why aren't you running out of here screaming? <laughs> <laughs> because I love this. I mean, this is my chosen field. I've done it for 30 years. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Lindsay, for that thorough report. Um, <laughs> I hope nobody on the admin team thinks they're getting a vacation anytime soon. <laughs> yes. Um, one other question. Is the reconsideration form or information on our webpage so folks can realize there is a system and what it is and fill out the form if, they, if they're not comfortable on, online? There it's, is, yes. There is um, the reconsideration form, there is the reconsideration process, and then as soon as it gets submitted, then it is um, responded to, and then the process is explained. So all of that is available, and then our staff know that that's the process, and they can provide it to customers who come into the buildings. Sure, because the more things that you can help folks do for themselves, lighting was the crazy though. I don't know, like Katie said, when they're running out, Screaming or walking on water, either one is going to be Stop. important. <laughs> Stop. No, but it's helpful for us because our I think part of our job as a board is to help you prioritize mm -hmm. and understand if we choose this up the scale of the priority list, we trade it for something else that we are going kind to of postpone. Right. That's the real world. And that seems to happen in our house most every day. And then in yours. <laughs> okay. Um we're there. The next item on the agenda is one that could take a lot of time. Um, and I know that we are at 4.30. I know that we are going to have to extend our meeting. Um, we have our recruiter here and we will be um, uh, going moving into executive session very soon. We can look at this briefly, but then after that, my suggestion is that we move directly to um, you know, the other things, I don't think they have a, a lot of things on them, so we move exec to executive session. But we will talk about this. This is not something that, this is something that could, uh, regular meeting location discussion, it's something that we could table and bring to the next meeting and still be on time for. Is that correct? Um, well, shall so we just turn it over to you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, I mean, we could wait and table that. Could we do that at like the special meeting? Because we have our meeting for March in Hayden already, right? It okay. starts in like, April. Okay. All right. Why don't we go ahead and talk about it, though, about what the issues are? And um, you can see what we're checking it out. Do you want to address this, Lindsay, or would you like me to? Um, I can start. And, um, at our well, one of the things I want to say is that at our last meeting, well, there were com there was a comment made 
after the meeting that we weren't providing enough space for members of the public to attend our meetings. And um, so I brought this up as an issue. And what we need to figure out is, as a group, are you guys wanting to stay in our biggest space? Or are you wanting to travel like you do every year to the other libraries and see these communities? And then if so, we need to have those meetings in an accessible place because like last year, I think it was at Apple, it was in a gymnasium and there were stairs. And so people, it technically wasn't accessible. And so I proposed suggestions of potentially meeting inside the libraries before the building opens so we could be in the buildings and have more space for public comment and still travel. So I just wanted to put that forward. And if we don't want to do that, then we also need to start reserving other spaces, which I need to know now because those are going to be occupied really fast. So I don't know. I hope that makes sense. It's I assume it's important because it's important to us to travel to these different libraries. I assume that the different locations it's important to them for us to come. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I, I, I would hate to not travel to the different locations just to make sure we had room for public comments. I'm sure that doesn't come out very, very nice. But um, I understand what you're saying about um, a different venue. I mean, but if, no, if it's not in the library, then it's not. Uh, and I assume that's why I see these 9 a.m. numbers. Right. Uh, because it's, <laughs> that means it's not, the library isn't open at that time on those days. Um, that's correct. Or they will open at like 11 or 1 o'clock. Okay. So in some instances, the meeting, like the last hour of the meeting would be when we're open. But in some of these, it's that they don't open until 1 o'clock okay. those days. We did have this discussion last year, too, because of the public comment. I know sometimes um, when it comes to public comment, uh, people are outside of the room that the actual meeting is is going on in, and they come in when it's their turn. And I mean, I think they can still hear. We have to. We would. We have to make the meeting um, accessible to people. You know, so they have got to be able to hear. So we, one way or the other, hearing is different though. Than do, during public comment, all you're hearing is the other people. Mm -hmm. talking and you just saying hear I'm just saying that we have to physically make the meeting for people to hear but there'll still be a lot of people that if we if we met during the times when the building was closed we'd have a lot more room for people mm -hmm. seems like a lot of people leave after the public comment though so maybe we wouldn't need to make it quite that early well we'd probably be <laughs> fed up out in the open area though oh right I mean yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. Um, I just I just think it's important for us to actually go to the locations. I do know that uh, in mm -hmm. checking with um, in checking with did we check with somebody? Yeah. Yes. OK. We just the meetings need to be made accessible, accessible. And also, if we know it's going to be a big meeting, we need I mean, if we have a sense that it's going to be a big meeting, we need to respond to that beforehand. Yeah. We need to try to do our best to make it available to sure. the public. Ooh. I know that they love it when we come. That part I do know. And with and last year, not being able to be in the library for the meeting felt weird. Mm -hmm. It was weird and it 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 I'm not sure it was conducive to as good a meeting. Um, a nine o'clock is quite early, <laughs> but <laughs> what do you guys think about trying this schedule this year? The Harrison, uh, is it closed? I mean, that's tiny anyway. So was it closed when we were there last time? Yes, it was closed. We had I, no. I can't Last remember. time it was a late meeting from two to five and the building was open. Okay. I believe. Is, is there a way, you know, all these are daytime meetings, which is the first round of people don't have the same access they do if it were an evening meeting. 
haven't. And I don't know if that's another consideration or another idea was library board meeting where it's in front of the public, but it's not much public there usually it can be within the small library. But can we tack on to that somehow if we went towards the evening using I can picture in, in um, FO, the city hall across the right. The city hall is not accessible. We can't use it. That's one of the things we have to keep, have to have. It's an accessible. Right. And accessibility is for physical access. Mm -hmm. Because there are way, we, you know, we can get some way to help folks get up and down the stairs if we have to. To meet that criteria. I'm not sure that's the right solution, but there are other ways sometimes to that. But the, the point now was, is there a way of our smaller libraries, primarily Ethel and Spirit Lake, being the smallest ones we have? Harrison. Harrison. Right. right. Uh, would be if there are a way to find a facility next door that we could do the public comment part in. And then maybe people the, need to be allowed to sit through the meeting as well. Yes. And that is oh, why yeah, that is why. It, so if you open up the whole building, then we probably would have room for we would probably be able to meet the, the standards of the open meeting law. And that's what we're trying to do. We're, really so we're not trying we're mm -hmm. not trying to be nice or even be there. Actually, what we're trying to be is is you know, meet the open requirements of the open meeting law. Not just that. I think we as a board want to be the reason we're going out there to various areas is to both see the facility and hear from the local folks. Make it easy for them to get to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um I I'm just chiming in here, which is I don't I don't have a problem with the proposed schedule. But, um, Seems like what needs to be done. And I also we added in the budget hearing, which is all the way in August, mm -hmm. but I did think it was important to get that on everyone's calendar. Sure. So that meeting is and that's post faults. Yeah. Yes. OK, are you guys saying yes to this? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. All right. There. Well, OK, well, we did it. I can't believe that. Yeah. It doesn't work. We'll OK, um, it is now we have what we can move on we can table the rest of our stuff because we don't have anything really to add to it is, is that correct we can move into executive session but we will need to extend our meeting and so um we had uh our this executive session down for um 60 minutes. 60 minutes 60 minutes if we extended it that doesn't mean we have to go that long but it would give us the time we needed for discussion mm -hmm. Let's learn. Can you guys go for an hour? I, I really thought Judy was going to make a motion. Um, you, no, no, no. You, are you looking for a motion to extend the meeting? Yes. Okay. No, I move that we extend the meeting until um, 530 or you want. That sounds good. Okay. Okay. All right. It's been moved to extend the meeting to 530. All those in favor? I am. Opposed? Okay. That sounds good. Um, and now we need a motion to go into executive session. Um, I move to go into executive session pursuant to Idaho Code 74-2061A for purposes of hiring public officer. Okay, it's been moved to go into executive session. Um, Idaho Code 74-2061A, and this is a roll call vote. Robinson, yes. McCree, yes. Meyer, yes. Robinson, yes. Um, and Blank, yes. Um, so the public is going to be asked to leave now. This is for to consider hiring a public officer, employee, staff member. It's uh, it's to consider hiring our director. And Are we, we going to reconvene? No. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene to adjourn. So the public comment section we've already covered. Yeah, we did that. Okay. We moved that so up. You're going to revisit it. No. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.